Well, we're in Luke chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 5 through 25. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 25. And uh, moving toward Advent uh, this month. So the Bible is a big book. The Bible has lots of words in it. One word you do not find in the Bible is the word blue. Now I gave you something else to be distracted by. You're going to be looking at the book and be flipping through. It's not, no, there's blue. I know I read it in here. It is, it's not in here. There, there's no word blue in the Bible. Turns out uh, in most ancient languages, there is no word for blue. Uh, this really came to our attention, I think, about 200 years ago. There was a, a, a person named William Gladstone who eventually became prime minister, if I understand it right, in the U.K., uh, but he was reading Homer, and he realized that Homer would describe things that we normally describe as blue, uh, but he would describe them in different ways. So I think, for example, Homer would talk about the sea, and normally we might say the deep blue sea or something like that. Uh, Homer said it was dark wine, the dark wine sea or something like that. And so... Uh, Gladstone began to really read in earnest in Homer and found that Homer never talked about the word, the color blue. And so uh, he had a theory that uh, the ancient Greeks were really colorblind. There was something about their genetic makeup that they could not recognize the color blue, and so they had no color, no word for uh, the color blue. But that's since been debunked. Uh, they, people have studied and they've found that everything was okay with the ancient Greeks when it comes to seeing the color blue. Uh, they just had no word uh, for the color blue. Well, uh, along comes a fellow by the name of Lazarus Geiger, and he expanded his, uh, his search, and he found uh, that, that blue doesn't appear in most ancient languages, that most ancient languages don't have a word for the color blue. Uh, the word uh, for blue actually first came to us through the Egyptians. The Egyptians had a dye that they used that was the color blue. And so they began to use a color, a, a word for the color. And then it sort of spread from there, I guess, along with the dye, the word for blue uh, went along with it. But what they found was uh, in most languages, uh, the colors that, that uh, appeared first were black and white. Uh, you know, and that made sense because it could be used to describe daylight and dark, you know, that, that sort of a thing. And so white and black, without exception, uh, was uh, always the first two colors to have words in, in languages. Uh, anybody want to guess what the third one was? Red. That's right, it was red. Uh, and they, they think maybe that has, some, it, they, they think maybe it has something to do with survival, that red's the color of blood, and so very soon people, uh, you know, found a, found a name for that. Uh, next would come green and yellow, or yellow and green, depending on the language, but those were the next two colors. Uh, people think that had something to do with uh, the, the green grass, or maybe the yellow wheat, I don't know. But it, they, they connected it to survival, and when you think about it, uh, there's not a lot that we need for survival that's colored blue. I mean, the sky, you look up and there it is, but uh, yeah, it, it, you don't really need to know the blue sky is up there for, for, for survival. Uh, anyway, then somebody else came along, a, a fellow by the name of Jules Davidoff, I think, and he studied uh, a tribe uh, that's still, still around in southern uh, uh, Africa in Namibia. It's called the Hemba tribe, and in this tribe, they still have no word for blue. And uh, they have tons of words for different shades of green, but they don't have any word for blue. And so what this person did, David Off, he uh, would, would take members of this tribe and he would show them a color wheel. And uh, if you could see this thing, uh, I mean, the colors are obviously, these squares are obviously green, and then you get to this one, and it's obviously blue. And the the tribe people that he was uh, showing this to uh, couldn't really differentiate. 
They, and, and it's not that they were, they were colorblind. It was just that they didn't have a word for blue, so they really couldn't say which square was blue as, a, as opposed to the, the other green ones. Now, what he also did was he showed them a color wheel uh, where all were different shades of, of green. Uh, in fact, all were the same shade except for one that was slightly different. And if you looked at that one, I know it was the, the case for me, there's no way I could pick out which square was different from the others. But to a person, when they would see this color wheel, they would say that one is the one that's different. That's the one that stands out. And it's probably because they had words for all these different shades of green. And so they could look at this, this, this shade that was just minutely different and say, that's the one that stands out. Uh, I don't really go much beyond green in my vocabulary. I think I have C green, P green, but I don't even know what that means, you know. So I don't have the words that they do, but they, and so that enabled them to pick out uh, which, one, which square was different from the others, but not the blue one. Sometimes uh, we need words to help us see what we're seeing. The ancient people could see blue, but they didn't have words to describe it, and so they didn't notice it. When it comes to what God is doing in our world, what God is doing in us, through us, around us, sometimes we need words given to us so that we can see what God is doing. How many of you know that God is always, always, always at work in our world? How many of you know that God is always at work in your life? Every time you get up in the morning and as you go about your day, God is at work. But sometimes we don't see it. And God sometimes needs to uh, give us words to understand. And that's why God has given us his word, scripture, so that we can see, oh, this is how God is at work. And we can see God at work among us. We come to this interesting story this morning. It's the uh, announcement that John the Baptist is going to be born. Uh, this is moving us toward the uh, nativity story, which will hit the fourth uh, Sunday of Advent. Uh, but here we have God at work among these people, God at work in the life of this priest, Zechariah, and uh, they're, they're not going to see it. They're not going to recognize it unless and until God brings the word to them. So in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, it says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. So how do we get to the point where we can see what is before our very eyes? How can we get to the point where we can see what God is doing in the world? Well, I suggest to you, my friends, that we see something here that Luke is really emphasizing that we need to emphasize in our own lives. One way, and it's an indispensable way for us to recognize what is going on in our lives and around us is for us to be obedient, for us to obey. Luke here tells us that in the lives, uh, in the lives of, these, of these two people, in the life of this couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, he says both were righteous, they walked blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Does that mean that they were perfect? Everybody shake your head and say no, but it is to say that they were obedient, that when you could look at the lives of these two people, when you could look at their life together, you see two people <laughs> who are faithfully committed to the Lord. That is the indispensable starting place for us to be able to see what, there it went, see what God is doing. It, it, it was off by just two seconds. It would have been a great amen. Bam! Or maybe I was off by two seconds. I don't know. But it's absolutely dis indispensable, my friends, that we are obedient to God to be able to be in tune with God and to see what God is doing in our world. 
Let me remind you that first pillar of discipleship from John's gospel. John chapter 8, verses 31 to 33. If you abide in my word, Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, another translation puts it, then you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The way we know the truth is to live in the truth that we already know. If we want to know about more truth that's going on in our lives, uh, how do we expect God to give us more truth if we're not responding to the truth that God has already given to us in black and white? So many of us want to know God's will about this or that, but to know God's will about this or that, we have to know God's will as revealed in this book. And this book tells us how we should live. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If we want to know what is going on in our world, what is going on in our lives, we've got to respond to what we already know to be the truth. Then we'll sort of be honed in. We'll be responsive to what God is doing. Verse 8. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And so what we might say was, a, was happenstance, was lucky. Uh, casting the lots was what we might, you know, we might compare it to rolling the dice or choosing straws. It was, uh, it was what we might say is random. People in Scripture knew that there was absolutely nothing happened that was random, especially when it comes to choosing who's, uh, who, who's next uh, to be on priestly duty. And this was a once-in-a-lifetime, apparently, a once-in-a-lifetime uh, situation, opportunity for Zechariah to be able to go into the sanctuary and burn incense. This was his, uh, his lucky day, his fortunate day. And so maybe Zechariah should have known that, uh, you know, God was turning things around here. He, he and his wife so wanted a child. It hadn't happened yet. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and maybe this should have cued, cued uh, Zechariah in. Uh, you're, you're, something's about to change here. Uh, God is doing something here in your life because he's selected for this uh, really enviable situation where he gets the privilege uh, as a Levite to go in and burn the incense here uh, in the sanctuary. But I want you to notice what it says in verse 10. It says, while all this was happening, it says, the whole multitude of the people were praying outside. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside. Luke likes to emphasize over and over and over again, both in Acts and in Luke volume, uh, both in this gospel and in Luke volume 2, which is Acts Luke emphasizes over and over and over again that good things happen, that God's kind of things happen when people are praying. When people are praying. For example, every other gospel says Luke just said, uh, that Jesus just chose his 12 uh, apostles. Luke tells us as Jesus was praying, it came to him who he ought to uh, choose as his apostles, and, and off he goes. He does it. In Luke and in Acts, good things happen when God's people pray. And there's a song in there. That's right. And so if you want to know what is going on uh, by God's hand in your life, if you want God to open up your eyes, a good place to be is to be in a place of prayer. A good situation to be in is a situation of prayer. To be a person who starts your day with prayer, to be a person who ends your day with prayer, who, to be a person who goes about your day in prayer. Scripture tells us, and Luke in particular tells us, that, that, that God opens eyes, that God gives direction, that God illuminates our minds and our hearts when God's people are praying. You want to know what God's will is? Pray. That's why Jesus taught us to pray. We start off, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. We begin our prayer uh, not by pouring out all the things that I want God to do for me, but to pour myself into God's kingdom, that I place myself squarely on board with God's kingdom and with God's agenda. And you know what happens when I place myself on board God's agenda? Then God's agenda begins to be open before me in my life. If you want to know what God is doing in the world, get on board with what God is doing in the world and get on board through prayer. Luke tells us very clearly that this is the way that God moves. Verse 11. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. By the way, if you have any notion of angels as being these cuddly little babies with wings that you see on toilet paper, get that out of your mind. Anytime angels show up in the Bible, people are terrified. (laughs) These are warriors. Uh, These are uh, captains in the army of God. And here one shows up and Zechariah doesn't go, oh, cute little. No, he falls flat on his face, I think. He's terrified. But the angel said to him what angels always say to them. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your what? Prayer Prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, filled with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the presence of God. It's the presence of God that filled the temple when uh, Solomon was dedicating that thing. And the Bible tells us something amazing. It tells us that that same Holy Spirit can fill us and should fill us. And that when the Holy Spirit fills us, God kind of things begin to happen. That the Spirit begins to guide our thoughts and guide our actions and guide our attitudes. Paul tells us, don't, be, don't, don't get drunk on too much wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul contrasts those two things. I think Luke maybe has a com, com, compadre with Paul here, has that image in mind. Uh, we, we've, we've probably all seen people who have been controlled by uh, <clears throat> strong, uh, strong drink. What happens when that happens? It affects everything that they do. It affects how they talk, it affects how they think, and it usually affects it in a very negative way, right? You can tell when somebody has been drinking. Same way with the Spirit. You can tell when somebody has been filled with the Spirit. It's evident in the way that they talk, it's evident in the way that they act, it's evident in the way that they think. And the good thing about being a part of the New Covenant The good thing about being a part of this side of the the cross and the resurrection is that the Holy Spirit who comes and fills us can have great influence on the way that we think, the way that we talk, the things that we do. And when that's the case, we can more clearly discern the will of God. And so be filled with the Spirit. This is part of your prayer life. Ask God to fill you. God, to lead me, to guide me, to to guide what I say and the way that I think. Uh, Paul tells us, be filled with the Spirit. That's why we we have to continuously be filled with the Spirit. Because we so easily, our hearts turn away and go in a different direction. And so constantly, consistently, we've got to come to God and ask for God to fill us with God's presence. We'll keep reading. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And I hope that verse really, uh, if you were with me last week, I really hope that that rang a bell, that verse that I just read, right? And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man. And my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. That seem harsh to you? It may. On the other hand, uh, if an angel comes up and tells you something, just a little advice, believe him. (laughs) Just believe what the angel says, all right? Messenger from God. Plus, how many times has this sort of thing happened in Scripture before? Zechariah, and you don't think that this can happen again? And the people were waiting for Zechariah. And they were wondering at his delay in the temple. What's taking him so long? And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. We don't know why Elizabeth kept herself hidden. She certainly didn't live in the days of social media, did she? She would have been posting it all over the place. But for some reason, she went and sort of kept these things to herself. Maybe it's just because she was kin to Mary, and that's what Mary tended to do, pondered these things in her heart. But she knew, Elizabeth knew, that the Lord has done this for me. The Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Of course, the people of that day saw barrenness, saw childlessness as a, as, as, as a sign of God's disfavor. And so Elizabeth says, God has reversed that. How did Elizabeth, how was she so convinced that God had done this? Well, unlike her husband, (laughs) she remembered the scriptures that she had read. She remembered what had been uh, proclaimed and taught in the temple and in in the synagogues. She knew the story. And there are so many echoes of the Old Testament scriptures uh, in uh, in this story. There's the story of Samson that's echoed here. Samson's parents were unable to conceive, and the angel shows up one day and says, you're going to have a baby boy. Not only that, the angel says to Samson's parents, and he is not going to, he doesn't need to drink any strong drink, and the razor doesn't need to uh, touch his head. In both cases, it's the Nazarite vow. In other words, this baby is going to be specially dedicated to God. It was okay for people to drink wine, not to get drunk, but it was okay for people to to drink wine. But for these Nazarites, uh, either for a time or for their whole life, and it seems like for Samson and for John the Baptist, it was for their whole life. Nobody uh, was going to cut their hair uh, and nobody was uh, to give them any strong drink and they certainly weren't uh, to take it. And so uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, gets this message. Uh, obviously her husband probably wrote it down for her, couldn't talk at this point. And she says, ah, that's just like in the case of Samson. Not only that, but she's probably reminded of the story of Samuel. Uh, In the story of Samuel, we have the same situation. You remember that story? We talked about it a few weeks ago, where here is Hannah, uh, Samuel's mom-to-be, and she is not una- unable to, to bear children. And she's there uh, at the tabernacle, and she's praying to God. And uh, Eli, who's clueless, uh, comes over and begins to chastise her and then realize, oh, she's just praying. She's just earnestly into this. And, and then God gives her a child, and it's Samuel. 
And uh, Samuel grows up to do what? A lot of things. But one main thing that Samuel does is he anoints King David. And this is going to be a theme that carries through this gospel. Because John the Baptist is going to grow up to anoint the son of David. And so there's a lot, it's so rich what's going on here. And Elizabeth sees this and she's excited because God uh, is, is involving her uh, in this story. Uh, and, it's, and it's echoing what God has done so many times before. And then there's Malachi 3 to 4. I told you. Uh, we, we, uh, we talked about this last week. Malachi says, God says, I'm going to show up at the temple. Uh, and, in, and in Luke's gospel, God's going to show up at the temple. Uh, and, and in Malachi, God says, but first, I'm going to send my messenger ahead of me to prepare the way. And so this is what's going on with John the Baptist. John the Baptist is going to be the one like Elijah, the messenger who goes before the Lord Jesus and prepares the way for the Lord to come to the temple and to bring uh, salvation and to bring the teaching of God and to bring uh, the good news. Uh, and so Elizabeth sees all this and she knows because she knows scripture, this is what God is doing in my life and in the world. And so here's number four. How do we, how do we understand the will of God going on, the hand of God at work in our lives? Well, we know scripture. When we know scripture, we know what God has done. We know the kind of things that God does, and we can recognize it in our own lives. We know the scripture, the story of scripture, the sacred story of scripture. We don't cherry pick the verses we like. We understand what God has been doing over the ages, and then we can say, aha, this is what God is doing in my own life. And this will protect us, and this will lead us, and this will guide us. How many of you know that God works in uh, mysterious ways? How many of you know that God is just known to work through people that other folks just ignore? How many, of you, how many of you know that God almost goes out of his way to work in and through the lives of people that other folks have written off? That's what God does over and over and over again. Too old? Not for God. Too insignificant? Not for God. Forget the Bible for this day when the angel shows, eh, God will still work through you. But these are the kind of people God uses to accomplish the things that God wants to in our world. So many times we think, oh, God won't use me. I'm past my prime. Uh, God's done. And Scripture over and over and over again says, no, you're just right. You're the kind of person God wants to use. You're the kind of person God will use. I love Zechariah's name. Zechariah's name means in Hebrew, the Lord has remembered. You ever feel like the Lord has forgotten about me? Just remember Zechariah's name, the Lord has remembered. You ever feel like, oh, God's done with me, God has forgotten? No, the Lord remembers. This is what? God does. God may have to do stuff to get our attention. Even if we're one of those important people that the world says. The priests, give me a break. If there's anybody in the world who should know, who should get what God is doing, it's a priest, it's a Levite, right? God shows up and they're like clueless. <laughs> The theme that runs through this book, by the way. It starts off this way. God does something, and an angel comes and has to say, hey, look, this is what God is doing. This book ends this way. You read Luke chapter 24. There's an empty tomb. Everybody's scratching their head going, what's going on here? An angel shows up and says, he's risen. <laughs> Duh. You know, it was, it was, sometimes we say the angel's like, he's risen. Maybe he's like, he's risen. Yeah, get the net, you know. Uh, 
Because sometimes we're so obtuse that God not only does things, but has to tell us, look, this is what I did. (laughs) And so we've got to be intentional about being tuned in through prayer, through the Word, through being filled with the Holy Spirit, through our, our obedience to know what God is doing. Because God is always at work. Amen? We just have to be tuned Uh, into it. How many of you know that there are things that happen in front of our eyes all the time that we just miss? Um, There there are things that if we're not intentionally looking for, we will not see them. Uh, I had an illustration of this recently. We uh, were were sideswiped in our car and uh, had to take it. It's still in the shop. It's been how many weeks ago? Anyway, uh, it's the holiday. It wasn't Isaac. It wasn't Isaac. He was safely in Nashville. But when we took the car into the shop, the ins- our insurance carrier said, you know, you can, get a, you can get a rental. Well, I don't know if you know this, but there aren't that many rentals around. So we went to Enterprise in town, and uh, we got our uh, rental, and up they drive this ginormous SUV monstrosity. Here it is. Here's your car. Kelly and I look at each other. No, I don't know. I don't know about that, Dale. <laughs> Kelly and I look at each other. We look at the guy and say, do you have anything smaller? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. You know, this is all we got. We got these, but they're spoken for. So we're driving around this uh, Nissan Armada. Is that what? Nissan Armada. I had no idea that these things existed in the world. I, uh, we have a Nissan pickup truck. I didn't know what Nissan uh, made as far as SUVs go, but apparently it's an Armada and we've been driving it for a couple of weeks now. Uh, anyway, but the strange thing happened when we started driving this Nissan Armada. All of a sudden, all these other people started driving them too. <laughs> right? All of a sudden, people said, the Berry Hills are driving the Nissan Armada. We ought to be influencers. That's what, Because we start driving the Nissan Armada, everybody starts driving the Nissan. Is that what happened? No, what happened? We were looking for them now. And so we're driving down the road, and Kelly goes, oh, there's a Nissan Armada. Oh, look, there's another one. Was it because people just suddenly? No, it was because we were locked in, and we were looking for it. See, that's what we need to be with God. God is always at work. God is at work in your life right now. Right now, God is at work. The question is not, is God at work? The question is, what is God doing? So we got to get locked in. And when we get locked in, through obedience, through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, through the Word, we can see what God is doing in us, through us, around us, among us. Amen.